just my name, and I'm currently also working at the auto group. Uh, so the agenda is some kind of introduction into testing and Flink, and also how we came there. Um, then there is. Uh, then I will show the framework itself, and then some short conclusion and outlook. Uh, introduction. So the auto group is kind of a conglomeration of 132 companies in around 30 country, countries across the globe. So the main part it does is multi-channel retail. Then there are also financial services that are backing this sector, and there are they call these services, this is transport and logistics and all the stuff. Uh, the auto group had also companies that they specifically own for that. Um, what we're doing in the auto group BI department where I work is we are collecting um, a click stream mainly from uh, a subset of all these uh, websites that we're running that are mostly web shops and we are building data-driven services on top of that in the sense that these services can then be used by these websites to enhance the user experience on these websites. So we're not doing exactly classical BI. Um, this is why we're also interested in all this real-time stuff because we kind of want to serve the customer in real-time. And what we're currently doing is um, closing size prognosis. Then we're also doing search optimization based on machine learning. And of course, we're doing user profiles on top of our data. Um, so when we begin, we began working with Flink uh, more than a year ago. And kind of, um, at first, we, we were kind of uh, wanted to decide between Flink and Spark. And what we did is um, we picked our most complex batch shop and tried to do it in streaming with both of these frameworks. And kind of working with this and also having some kind of complex job, we soon um, had some problems um, or some, some hiccups. So, there was mostly a transparency. So when you run Flink, it's a, it's a black box. You have your input and your output. And what we did is kind of, we hooked up Flink to the actual click stream. Um, and then we saw some, some numbers or some text coming out in our uh, output Kafka. So this is not very assuring to see this if your program is working or not. Um, then it's, yeah, it's kind of traceability is this uh, relation of input and output you're not really seeing. You're not know if you see an output uh, event, you're not know on which basis this output event was calculated. And of course, reproducibility, if you have a f kind of uh, case where the pipeline doesn't behave how it should, you want to try that case again. And if you're just running it against the actual production data, you're not going to going to be able to do that. Um, so we kind of started thinking, how can we, can we solve this? And the first we came up, we want some visualization. We want to see something. We want to see what's happening in the, uh, in the operators. We want to see um, which data belongs to what data, and this kind of visualization of what is happening in Flink right now. And then we, uh, maybe this is just when we have a vis visualization of what is happening in Flink right now we still don't have the cause and effect visualized. So the next thing was uh, we want to kind of a data lineage graph for some data. We want to see um, how the event um, propagated to our pipeline and how it was transformed and what is the kind of the result of it and then kind of also backtracking where you have the result and you see um, kind of the lineage throughout your um, throughout your pipeline, this is, could be achieved with message tracing like, like Sipkin or so. And, um, but when we started to actually think about how to do this, it quickly became clear we kind of have to uh, 
go very deep into Flink to implement this. Um, and it's not easily done, and there's a lot of overhead and so on. So this was kind of uh, not feasible for us. So what we then came up with, mm -hmm, maybe we create a nice playground for the dev where he can, uh, in a controlled environment, uh, develop his, um, his applications. And it's kind of a comfort zone for him where he's not uh, exposed to all this, um, these real world problems. Um, and this is kind of what we did. Uh, so now I'm going to show you how uh, testing Apache Flink applications maybe look like. This is um, a typical application. It's just a standard word count with just, uh, 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 uh. yeah, word is, uh, yeah, you all know this. There's some kind of filter here, and it. it's not, not very uh, uh, important right now. You have a time window that is uh, aggregating some, some counts, and what you kind of have to do for what you kind of have here in here to test is of course um, your user-defined functions, um, some simple filter. If I want to test this, uh, the test to be done is fairly simple. Um, this is very basic. Um, if you have some more advanced um, operators that rely on more um, that kind of need some deeper runtime parts of Flink. This is not so easily done, but it can be done. Uh, what you also have is the streams transformations, where you kind of have a data stream and transform it into another kind of data stream, like by this window aggregation. This was testable, like in this, you just create your local environment, um, um, make a data stream out of a collection, then um, just attach your function you want to test here or your transformation and um, use this data stream utils collect tool that is, uh, that is, or that is included into Flink, not directly into Flink, but in, in some sub uh, project, and then you get some kind of uh, iterator out of it where you can iterate over and test if the result is like one. This, um, this works because of um, the, this, uh, this data source starts emitting data, and as soon as it's emitted this last tuple, it will close itself. And because Flink is also a batch processor, Flink will start to shut down um, the processing. And then what also happens is when Flink shutdowns, it um, flushes out all open windows. And this is why um, you can do this in a matter of uh, millise uh, milliseconds. And you get some results even if the window is not finished. Unfortunately, or not unfortunately for me, they changed this behavior um, in Apache in Flink 1.0, uh, 1.0, so this doesn't work in the current Flink version anymore. So what I have done is kind of, let's see, yeah, this functions very well. <laughs> so what you're doing in Flink Spector for on the first look looks very similar. Um, it's kind of you want a data stream. It is kind of the strings and and uh, tuples and 
then you say create test stream. Um, this you see here, this is extends the data stream test base um, uh, support uh, chipped with uh, Flink Spectre, so you can start building your tests on top of this. Um, and then you need some kind of input for this. So we're going to use event time input because we want to test something where time plays a role. Uh, Uh, no, that's not how to do it. This is can be done easier. Du, 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 du. Set some tuple. So now we have a builder. So we can. This kind of uh, looks like instructions for the data source. So it should start with the first tuple. Uh, emit the first tuple. And then, kind of, we want to have some subs subsequent tuples um, like this. And so now it kind of looks like. Ugh. So now it kind of looks like a little bit more, um, a little bit more readable than the other test, but it uh, hasn't any any real uh, worth. So what we now can do is we can inject some information about the time. Um, so I want the stream up to this point. I want to have it into my first window, which runs to two minutes. And um, I also want to have something to aggregate for this so I can actually say him to um, emit this result two times into this window. So what we kind of have now is this will, uh, for, our, for our test, it will produce two windows. This is already not possible with the standard or with the old way of uh, testing Flink because you could only test one window. You would fill up the window, the window would be flushed by, by the shutdown, but here you can actually test uh, arbitrary number of windows or arbitrary time period. Um, okay, so just have to do this. So, so now I have kind of my input and now I'm say, I have to give him some expectations. So the test produces like, also tuple and int, tuple of integer and strings. So we can say expected record. So now I'm saying I want to see, wait, maybe take this away, this will make it easier. So I want to see um, a one, tuple of A1 with the count of one and also I expect <laughs> um, A2 with the count of two because I injected it here two times. And so this is all we need for our test. So we just need to um, include the actual thing we want to test. This is with the word count class. We want to count, test this transformation. And now we put in the stream and we say him our expectations. So this is all you need. And now you can run it if you use the right shortcut. Uh, and da -da -dim. the test passes, so this will not, so showing that a test framework can pass a test is not very trustworthy, so also I can make the test fail. If I say, if I can refine these 
records. So right now, these expected records are very soft requirement. It, it only um, wants to see each of these records in the output, and then it will say it's okay. It doesn't care for anything else. It doesn't care for duplicates, for noise, for order, nothing is important for it. This is also uh, a thing that makes the... I'm going to go back to this. So I can say I want to see only this, only the stuff, and then if I run it again, it will fail because it will kind of recognize there was too much. So now I wanted to see this output, but I got this output. So this is maybe the hello world of Flink Spectre. Um, ta -ta -ta -ta. So, what actually is the concept here? You specify some input. You can then acquire a data stream from that input specification. You define some expectation for the resulting data stream, and then you have just to uh, apply the expectations to the produced data stream. This is the four steps you need to do. Um, what is done with this um, kind of thing is it's actually creating a pipeline where you have your test source, then the input is serialized into the test source. And what the test source does is uses this description of the input to create um, timestamps and also it um, calculates watermarks based on that input. And in the background, the pipeline is switched to event time to make this work. Um, and what the test sync does is um, it's paired to some, uh, it contains some publisher that it's pa paired to su subscriber that runs concurrently to the test. And this subscriber um, contains the logic to verify this. And there's also a trigger which um, you can use to uh, kind of terminate a test earlier or premature, but I will talk about this later. So, uh -huh. let's show something. I think I matched up, so well, let's see. So this is, this is actually not expecting, this is the input. So for the input, um, we have mainly this event time input builder and the uh, syntax kind of look like this. You have this, you have um, these three ways you can define time in this. So there's this after. This will just um, define the time after the the first. Um, it will define the time after the. Okay, now I'm kind of... It will... <laughs> okay, it will define the time after the um, event that comes before it. So this, there will be kind of a time gap of one minute here between this and that. And you also can use before, what before will do it, um, it will uh, produce input that is not, that not has concur um, continuously rising timestamp, it will um, produce out of order input, if you want to test that. Um, and into window is kind of like, um, it says I want to have all of the input up to that point into this specific window, what it does is it, um, because if you just attach here for uh, um, a timestamp of four seconds, this will actually not go into the window of four seconds. So what it does, it um, subtracts some time to get it into the uh, 
the right window and what you can do, you can repeat all of this um, and also define some time for between all these repetitions. This um, enables you to kind of um, program some patterns and then remove, um, repeat, repeat these patterns. Um, and what it actually does, this will, um, this one minute thing will also um, add some time to the inter window. So this, uh, for the repetition, this will not go into the window of four seconds. Oh, this is a bad example, but into the window of uh, one minute and four seconds. This is kind of, um, I'm still a little bit not very happy with this. Um, the semantics are not, not totally clear, but the into window is kind of used, kind of defined as an invariant, and then you can add some time to it, but um, it's not so clear when you look at it. Um, for the, for these list-based expectations, you have this create, where you can add here a list. We want to see one, two, three, four, and um, if you do this, and apply this to this output, it will, it will succeed. If you add the only um, modifier, it will fail because there's a five in the output. If you remove that five, this is valid. Um, then you can use same frequency. This is um, kind of all this stuff has to be in the same frequency. All the output has to have the same frequency as the expectations, so this will fail because of the three. If you remove that, um, and you also can um, put some um, order uh, restrictions on it, so you can say, I want to be, have this needs to be in order, but it's uh, not strict. This means it will um, kind of not look for a sequence, but just the, the order has to be right. So this fails because the four is before the one, but if you add the four uh, to the back, the order of the events you're, you're kind of interested in is correct. If you say, um, I want strict order, it actually has to be in that order. And what I, what I did here is you can kind of um, also, these order statements you can only apply to a, um, a certain part of your input. So I said um, uh, I want to only from only the input from this index has to be in order, so it is sufficient to be two, three, four, and the one is ignored. Um, this goes pretty far. You can say two and four, and you can also um, add a list of um, individual indexes. So, and of course you can combine all of, the, all of these. So what it does is we'll just add these, um, these patterns you combined and test them one by one against your output so the frequency is not right, so you fix this and then this will work. So this is, um, this goes pretty far but we kind of discovered that this is not, um, this is too much of a hassle most of the time um, when you want to do some tests. Um, you don't want to uh, define all the input, uh, all the output you're um, expecting, uh, especially if you have some, uh, some complex data types. This is too much work and um, nobody will do this and then the whole, um, the whole uh, goal of um, many small tests is kind of overthrown by the developers. Uh, what we did then is kind of we said we want to make this assertion based and we want to have get, be able to uh, apply these assertions to um, single values in our in our uh, uh, in our complex data type. So I've done this here for tuples. You just give some keys to the uh, tuple. So, and then you can just say, uh, uh -huh, I want to 
one, for our test, it's, uh, the word should start with A, and the count should be greater than three, and then you say, I want to, this, um, this has to be true for each record I'm seeing in my output. So what you also can do is you can, this is a quantifier for the records, and then you have a second um, uh, dimension you can uh, quantify, and this is how many of these assertions in your list um, you want to use. Uh, so kind of when I say one of them, only one of these has to be true for each record. So now you can query your, the output your quest created like a table and that you say, if you kind of do this, then I'm a, you're looking at the whole table, then you, um, you can look at the sub, only at some, um, because uh, you're not interested in some part of your output, you can do this. Um, you can look at, you can search for only one record, you can also, give them um, concrete numbers, what you see at least, at most, and all of the stuff. Um, and you can, can drive this pretty far. And also these, these, um, I, these are actually measures um, implemented with Hamcrest or implemented on top of Hamcrest. So you can, can combine this, combine two of these measures or you can combine it with the others. So you can do, or you can also all, nest them and all this stuff. Um, this goes pretty far what you can do with this, but um, then the test is kind of hard to understand. Um, for the implementation, this is just, all this stuff is um, just, some, uh, just some loop where you can say it's valid when, when this, uh, when this uh, this is met. So um, for the execution part, what is done is um, the the test sources and the testings are actually parallelizable. So you can run these tests in parallel uh, or in with paralyz with parallelism enabled and. Um, there's a simple message protocol here that will send the output to the subscriber and he will do this while the test runs. He will feed the verifier with the output and also the triggers um, is feed with, fed with the output and the verifier can incrementally during the test theoretically start to verify the output. And if they receive some, if they, Get if they get the message that the uh, um, testings are closed, the verifier will just um, propagate the results to the test stream environment, and you will see them. Um, also, the trigger uh, which can stop the running before the actual uh, all events are going through to your pipeline um, can also. Uh, when this happens, um, the execution stops the local cluster or um, stops the execution of the job and the verifier is asked for the result. In this situation, he says the result is not valid and also there's, of course, a timeout built into all of these run, runs um, which can also trigger, but if the timeout um, triggers, the verifiers also ask for the uh, test results. So I think I don't have much time left, so. Trying to show. So this is kind of test um, that I built on top of a, a POC of us. And kind of this thing aggregates the top views or the top purchases on the websites. And you can see 
Um, it's uh, kind of you say, I want this event type, I want to have the top 10 events, and then you, here can you say the dimensions of the window it uses. And here it tests the aggregation. So for the aggregation you put in some windows, this is kind of the same I showed before. And here you just test the filtering. So you put in this events and you only want to see, it because it's purchases, you want to only see checkout pages. And what you actually do here is you assert that type is checkout for each record. So you only have to look at type for your test. And here you want to test the top N, you want to test the top N calculation. And what you do here is kind of, you want to assert that the type is checkout. Um, the product ID should be A, so C, B, or D. And because of the top three stuff is all greater than 100, um, you can do this by say, I want the total must be greater than 100, and then on each record. Um, so we can run this fast, and then I try to wrap up. Uh, it's not what I wanted to do. So as you can see, the first test runs a little bit longer because he starts a cluster for this test, but all subsequent tests use this cluster and um, they're running uh, a considerable amount shorter. So, uh, in conclusion, you're able to write small and uh, concise test cases for this. The runtime is pretty extensible. It has some simple interfaces you have to implement if you want to plug in your own verifiers. Um, the integration into existing test platforms is pretty easy, so this runs with JUnit. You can do um, also continuous deployment on top of that. Um, what are kind of the problems is our explicit processing time windows. Um, I didn't find a solution for this yet. Um, or not a, not a good solution. And I think the input specification is still too expensive. It should be kind of as the output specification. It should be a middle, little bit more concise. Um, this also uh, some stuff. So for the outlook is, I want to have Scala test support. Um, the problem is Hamcrest cannot handle the Scala types. Um, then I want to do some symbolic testing integration uh, with Scala check. This should be probably pretty easy to do, and it will be very interesting to use. And what it's actually, the system should be able to handle tests that run on the actual cluster because the cluster is also already running um, in local mode and it's totally isolated and it should be able to handle the same thing on the cluster. And you could do some throughput and latency test and some chaos monkey test and all of this stuff. That would be pretty cool. Okay, so all this stuff is available on GitHub and it's on, released on Maven. And also, I have to say that we're hiring. So thank you. Uh, any questions? <laughs> we still have a little bit of time for this. Thanks. Uh, first of all, great project. Thank you. Um, I have a question. The, the input specification for the test data is kind of hard right now. You have to manually type it in the, in, in the Java code, right? So there is no input output file. So you have a like a folder with the input files and a folder with the output files, and you just run the Flink Spectre against it, and it will process the folders. Um, because you have in the background, you have an actual um, so the the environment this thing runs on is accessible in the in the tests. So you could 
just use your own um, from file uh, input and um, just plug in it, plug it into these tests. You don't have to use the the actual or the test source. You can use any source for that. You can use Kafka and then use some triggers to stop the test prematurely. Even if your Kafka source never stops, um, the triggers uh, will stop the will stop the test for you. So you have the possibility to do this pretty easily. Um, but what, what I wanted to, do, to have, I wanted to have some kind of DSL with, where you have all the information about the tests that the developer needs to understand the test in the actual test. So if there are any not other question? any more questions, I think we can wrap this up. Okay. So thank you. Um. Thank <laughs> you.